Now it's time for our third highlighted presentation of the conference. Our speaker, David Beckman, was invited to the 30th anniversary conference in Orlando by the Professional Development uh, Committee, where he delivered a, a memorable implementation session called Nail a Speech, Launch a Career. He talked about death by PowerPoint, and as I was doing my slides earlier, I kept thinking about that in the back of my mind. It was just gnawing at me, so thanks for the coaching, David. The content was delivered so well that the CII asked David back this year. David has a long resume, but the short answer is he spent his career in the process control starting as an application engineer, and he's re retired as a senior vice president for systems and solutions from Emerson Process Management. He now spends his time delivering motivational speeches to the process industry and to his congregation at First Presbyterian uh, Church in Marshalltown, Iowa. Please welcome David Beckman, who's going to ask us to think for a change. Well, thank you, Rex. I can think of no better uh, presentation to follow than the one I just did. That was wonderful. Just to see those young people up here and all of the potential. That's what we're going to actually be talking about today, thinking for a change. Because you are where your thoughts have brought you. And you will be tomorrow where they take you. It's all about thinking and Oops, um, there we go. Sorry. Life consists of what a man is thinking about all day, and certainly we have to think outside the box. And so here's an illustration of a penguin who's thinking outside the box. His wife is standing in the back, and he's saying, watch this. And you can imagine what that's like. We're in a city here where... Risk-taking is the name of the game. Ryan Hunter Ray was the winner of the Indianapolis 500 this year, and by the closest margin, I think second in history, only uh, six hundredths of a second was the winning edge. And so it was a lot of risk-taking in the last couple of laps. This race has a long history, going all the way back to 1909 when the first race happened, and there was a lot of risk. And I'm thinking a lot about CII and how over the years, we in this particular group have helped to bring safety and helped to bring a whole new environment to the construction industry. In this particular race, they raced on gravel. So as these cars went around, there were two people in every car, the driver and the mechanic. And at that particular race, six people died because the stones were coming up into the windshields, windshields were cracking, the goggles were cracking. It was a horrible race. And so six people, two accidents, and then two spectators died because they didn't know about fences. You just stood there and watched the cars. And so very quickly, a change had to be made, and 3.2 million bricks were laid, thus the name Brickyard. And today there's one yard of bricks which forms the finish line. And so we have a safety concept in the race, and the race today is much safer than the race was in former years, primarily because safety even in a race, is paramount. And so today, as we think about what's coming, I don't know what's going on here, I'm sorry. This doesn't happen. But until you get up here, right, Artie? Here's the race with the traditional bottle of milk. And so today I'm going to be bringing three points, values, innovation, and... I'm going to have to switch this myself. Availability. I wrote a little paragraph here that I think would be interesting for you to think about. Our old ways of thinking were never designed to carry the strain of a whiplash economy, technical disruptions, global competitors, fractured markets, omnipotent customers, rebellious shareholders, and idealistic employees who strive for significance over pay. Think about that paragraph. That is the environment 
that we are struggling with today, omnipotent customers, customers who think they know everything, shareholders, idealistic employees, people who think they can move from the bottom to the top in just a matter of months. As I'm thinking about engines, I'm thinking about the Audi engine and how that thing has a turbocharger on it, and it's probably the epitome of the internal combustion engine. But who thinks that in the next 20 years, the internal combustion engine is going to be the power plant in our cars? Probably not. It's going to be something of the hybrid version. And so as I look back into history, I'm looking at some things that need to change. One of the people that I read when I was in business school was a guy by the name of Winslow Taylor, Frederick Winslow Taylor. Anybody ever heard of Frederick? Wi a few, good. Frederick Winslow Taylor came up with a scientific method for business. And that scientific method was that instead of people doing the thinking and the doing, that he would split it. There would be the thinkers and the doers. That started 100 years ago. Henry Ford picked it up. Most of manufacturing picked it up. So that there were the people that did the idea generation, and there were the people that did the work. And we had unions that developed in order to protect those workers from the thinkers on top. I just picked out a couple of Winslow Taylor's statements here. These are very telling. So he can say when he was in front of Congress, without the slightest hesitation, Taylor told the Congressional Committee that the science of handling pig iron is so great that the man who is physically able to handle pig iron and is sufficiently phlegmatic and stupid as to choose this occupation. You get that? He, they're so stupid, they choose this occupation. They're rarely able to comprehend the science of pig iron. It gets worse in his book, Principles of Scientific Management. He said it's only through the enforced standardization of methods, enforced adoption and the best implements and working conditions. Notice the word enforced. Enforced cooperation, this faster work can be assured. And the duty of enforcing this is for management alone. Now, the problem with that is that we have now a whole generation of people where only one in five workers finds their job satisfying. Only one in five are engaged in the marketplace. Why is that? Because this dichotomy between the thinkers and the doers has taken the soul out of business. And so my premise to you today is that we have to join that back up together again. And so as we look at the situation in front of us, we see the reason that is. We have people like Bernie Madoff who have absconded with billions. We have Enron who became the smartest guys in the room, okay. Siemens, kickbacks, Lehman Brothers out of business, telephones, hacking, some of our own corporations in trouble because they fudged on the numbers. No wonder the heart and soul of business is gone. Some managers seem to behave like mercenaries. They are all back in the Winslow Taylor era where they are treating employees as if they are chattel, if they, as if they are machines. They exploit the vulnerable customer. They exploit the vulnerable employee. So bad has this gotten that the business executive in polls now is worse than lawyers. Can you imagine that? We have fallen below lawyers. We are just above members of Congress. <laughs> and that's just above car salespeople. Now, this, uh, uh, this poll was taken a few years ago. It's possible that we could go below so car salespeople these days. So the soul is gone. Gary Hamill says it so well. The defenders of capitalism, and we believe in capitalism in this room. I know we do. 
They argued that the common good is maximized when everybody is working for their, his or her own self-interest. That's true. Hamill, though, says there's a caveat to this. There's a caveat in that he believes there's a nuclear fission that is got to be contained in a containment vessel. And that containment vessel is a set of ethical principles that ensures these self-enlightened interests, these people that are making all the decisions, don't dissolve into unbridled selfishness. Hamill concludes by saying, unfortunately, the groundwater of our business today is now heavily contaminated with the runoff from morally blinkered egomania. And I think that's true. And so, as we look at annual reports, we see this repeated over and over again. Those words that, that just stick in the minds of everybody. It's all about shareholder value. It's all about our assets, our employees. It's all about profitability. But I'm thinking that there's another way. In fact, as this thing got worse and worse, back in the 80s crash, we had people like Goldman Sachs who were speaking out of both sides of the mouth. You know, it's possible to do something legal but not ethical. I don't know if it, in this in engineer-infested room uh, whether we realize what a synthetic collateralized debt obligation is. Anybody know what that is? Uh, not too many. Uh, what that just means is that if you pile all the bad mortgages together, somehow they turn good. And so what we'll do is we'll put a credit default swap on one side of the ship and we'll sell synthetic collateralized debt on the other side and we'll just bet against ourselves. And so Goldman Sachs makes millions as loans default. And yet in their sales department, they're pushing synthetic collateralized debts. This is unethical. And no wonder our young people are feel betrayed. And so the gist of my argument today is you're not what you think you are, what you think you are. You get that? You're not what you think you are, but what you think, that's who you are. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today because how we think really changes a lot of things. If we're not thinking right, the unthinkable can happen. The unthinkable. The unthinkable happens when we make compromises all along the way. It's like lining up with slices of Swiss cheese. As long as the holes don't line up, you can stay safe. I liked the presentation we had yesterday where we talked about the almost problems, where we had uh, almost failures. And that's what happens with the Swiss cheese. But every once in a while, the Swiss cheese lines up. And when that happens, we have a disaster. I have a little video clip here from a man named Bob B. He used to work for Shell, and now he's a consultant. And he looked at the deep water horizon. Now, I don't mean to, to cast any disparage on uh, BP here, but I want you to think about how we had this double layer of management and doers and how that contributed to this accident. Oil industry veteran Professor Bob B has investigated 30 offshore accidents. He's an expert in the human dynamics of disasters and has studied the deep water horizon closely. His voice was damaged by toxins during his investigation into the New Orleans levee collapse of Hurricane Katrina. They didn't want to uh, blow up this system. They didn't want to die. Um, and so there has to be an explanation of how they did this. Frequently, we think of things as we want it to be, not as it is. So if we want it to be okay, we find everything we can to support that thinking. 
So they found an implausible explanation to explain the drill pipe pressure away because that's what they wanted to believe. The explanation is simple, logical, and wrong. The explanation is simple, it's logical, it's wrong. They were into a culture where thinking was done here, doing was done there, and it caused a problem. Carlene Roberts highlights this well. She's from Cal Berkeley's Center for Catastrophic Risk Man management, and she says, look at the industrial accident problem. Everyone thinks it's a technological problem. It is not. It's a management problem. So how are we going to do this? Let's go into that and let's see how this works. It has a lot to do, as I said, with the annual reports. Fukushima is another example of this. Who would think that you should take the spent nuclear fuel rods and put them on top of reactors? Well, you would if you're trying to save a pump. Who would think that you should put a 23-meter seawall when you can see in history that waves have, have gone over the top of that? Well, you would if you're trying to save cost. Who would think that you should put emergency generators in the basement when the proper place to put them would probably be up on the hill? In fact, why not put the whole plant on the top of the hill? There were engineers along the way who questioned this, but it was overruled by this layer on top that said, we're the thinkers, you're the doers. A CBS report came through and highlighted this, and so I want you to listen very carefully because something happened in this particular incident that was very uncharacteristic. It's er very uncharacteristic for Japanese, for sure. One year ago tonight, rising radiation forced the evacuation of most emergency workers from the Fukushima nuclear power plant. The tsunami that struck Japan five days earlier set off an emergency unlike any before, the meltdown of three reactors at the same time. One of the experts sent into the emergency was Charles Casto. He's a former nuclear plant operator working for the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. He was America's top expert at the scene and an eyewitness to history. Essentially, they were blind. Uh, they were very, there was very little instrumentation that survived the tsunami and the accident. So uh, you, you have to use uh, secondary information. What was it that you wanted to know? Well, we wanted to know everything. <laughs> Charles Casto's team in Japan reported back to Washington in this conference call one year ago today. I would see the worst scenario probably being uh, three reactors uh, eventually uh, having, for lack of a better term, a, a meltdown. Uh, so the, the reactors would likely eventually, you would eventually breach primary containment and have some type of relief. That worst case was happening. A team led by plant manager Maseo Yoshida was holed up in a radiation proof command center. And as the crisis grew, Yoshida wanted to flood the reactors with seawater. The plant owner rejected that idea. What in your estimation, looking back, knowing what you know now, was the key moment that prevented this from becoming a much greater tragedy than it was? When uh, Yoshida-san put the ocean water to the reactors, that was a key moment. Did everyone agree that flooding them with seawater was the right thing to do? Not everyone agreed. But the plant manager decided to do that on his own. That's right. It's not very Japanese. It's a uh, very reactor operator. The plant owner ordered Yoshida to stop. He said that he would, but he lied. He continued to flood the reactors. Had he not, we now know that the cores may have burned all the way into the earth, releasing untold amounts of radiation. Recently, I've been talking to a uh, senior level person from URS who has a contract at the Fukushima plant to help them to contain this nuclear waste. He now declares it as the worst natural disaster or man-made disaster that has ever hit the planet. We have two reactors that have burned through the core and are migrating water to the sea. 
we have vacuums that are pulling up, up out of the sea, putting it into over a thousand tanks, which are not earthquake proof. There are lots of earthquakes in Japan. We are now in the process of putting rods down to try and freeze the land around the reactor. The nuclear power or the power that it will take to run this to keep the land frozen is a million dollars a day just for the electricity. So we have a disaster. Now the uh, estimate to fix this is $1.5 trillion. We've never had anything like this before. So bad is this that Germany has decided to shut down all of its reactors by 2020. Japan has no nuclear reactors running. When I was in Japan just a few weeks ago, none of the buildings are air conditioned. The Narita Airport, it's the middle of summer, is in the 80s to 90s because there is no air conditioning in the Narita Airport. They are buying gas at $16 a thousand. This is a huge disaster. Could it have been changed? I think the answer is yes, it could have been prevented. And it really boils down to a quote that I discovered from Peter Drucker some years ago. I was reading his last book. I don't know if you know Peter Drucker. He was from the 20th century, a business analyst who helped many companies to succeed. And Peter Drucker wrote this in his last book, Business in the 21st Century. Management is doing things right. Leadership is doing the right thing. Now what Peter's saying is there's two groups. A group up here that's normally been doing the thinking and it has to be tasked to do things right. That means to do all the HR, that means to create the finances to make a company run. But then there's another group and that's where CII comes in who are tasked to do the right things. Let me explain that a little better. I think uh, Dilbert, points that out so clearly. We have the pointy-haired boss and Dilbert who oftentimes has to encourage his pointy-haired boss to do the right thing. This is true for us, for maintenance, for safety, for design. There's a verse in the Bible that I, because I'm a preacher, I think about these things on one side and the other side, coming from Romans. And it says, don't let the world, or in this case, that upper level, squeeze you into its mold, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may do what is good, acceptable, and perfect. And this is where we come in. Let me show you on a diagram how this works. We're going to set the balance right here. So we have this management team up here that's tasked to do things right. As I mentioned, they have to set up the corporation. That corporation has to build the company with the people, with the resources, with payroll, with all of the operational procedures. That's a good thing. But then there's another group that needs to come in from the bottom to do things right. That's the mid-level engineering team. That's us. Now, here's where I think we can bring CII in because as we begin to think about this, as jobs begin to become more complex, our owners need help. They can't do all the engineering in-house. They need engineers from without. One of the reasons that you're at this, at this conference is because we can cross-pollinate. Now, we've been talking ever since I got here about labor shortages. So there's people missing at this table. There's people from my generation who are retiring. And more than ever, now we need to cooperate. In fact, Wall Street Journal is just replete with article after article showing that this new era that the United States is in is the Industrial Revolution all over again. 66 industrial products, projects worth $90 billion in Louisiana alone over the next five years. And David Constable says our main problem is shortage of skilled labor. I don't have to belabor that point. You know this. In fact, at CIRA week, Bob Franklin from Exxon Mobil Division said, we are now paying four times 
as much for a project as we used to simply because we don't have enough people and we're having to escalate their pay in order to get them to work on our projects. Where is the shortage? If you look at the graph, it's in engineering. 52% of the engineers are, is the gap. So I was thinking that about that and I came across this little cartoon. Here's Lucy coming in and here's Linus. We have a couple of Brazilians with us this week and uh, my condolences uh, to that. Um, I was pulling for you. And uh, so Lucy's uh, coming in and Linus is watching the World Cup and she's not interested in a World Cup. So there's the remote down there in front of Linus. And so uh, she comes up to Linus and she demands the remote and she pulls her fist together and she says, you see this? When these fingers come together, this becomes the ultimate weapon of mass destruction. Now give me the remote. And so she hands the remote to him. Uh, he hands the remote to her and then he goes and slinks off and he looks at his own hand and he says, why can't you guys get organized? And that's where we are in our business. We want to get organized because I think Werner von Heisenberg said it well. We have to remember that what we observe is not nature herself, but nature exposed to the way we question it. So now I come into innovation because once we get our values right, once we get that thing settled what, that we need both teams to work together now the way to move forward is through innovation so I'm going to give you a little quiz and the little quiz starts with how we get a company to move from here to there the problem is nobody ever wants to go there until here becomes uncomfortable and if you think you got a problem you should try this in the ministry because in the ministry, I tell them about there. There is golden streets, harps, wings, all that sort of thing. And I say, anybody want to go there? No, everybody wants to stay here. <laughs> Nobody wants to leave here to go there, even though I talk about there. And the companies are the same way, exactly the same way. As long as things are comfortable, nobody wants to go there until it's, it's very uncomfortable here. So now we have a little quiz. We'll see, uh, maybe some of the young people will get this before some of us older folks. I will give you one hint after another. First hint, this company has been cr uh, turning creative ideas into breakthroughs for well over a century. Now your only clue in that is that the company is over 100 years old. So you can't get that yet. Two, they invented grammar checkers. Any ideas yet? Feedback? IBM, possible. They invented the electronic dictionary in 1985. A little struggle there. They invented the laptop word processor in 1989. Yeah, pretty silent. Okay, here's another one. They invented PDAs, personal dig digital assistance, in 1994. Like a Palm Pilot. Anybody still have a Palm Pilot? <laughs> yeah. And anybody got an answer? He Hewlett Packard? The answer is Smith Corona. Now, Smith Corona is a very interesting company because I went to their website and uh, the website said this, on the eighth day, God created Smith Corona. <laughs> on the eighth day, God created Smith Corona as if they have some indelible right to last forever. The arrogance of it. Let's just look at their history a minute. Back in 1877, they invented a shotgun. And uh, then in 1914, they helped the uh, World War I with soldiers, and the company was very successful. <clears throat> so successful that they built the tallest building in Seattle. 
By 1995, however, they declared bankruptcy the first time, and by 2000, they declared bankruptcy for the second time, and their assets were bought by a thermal printing company who makes sticky labels. And that's the result and the end of Smith Corona. Let's look at their history. 1904, they invented a typewriter with upper and lower case. They had an adding machine, the first portable electric. I remember this back in 73, the cartridge, instead of threading the, the uh, ribbon, you could put a cartridge in. And then we had movable type. We had font change with a daisy wheel. And this is all innovation. They invented the first, top, first laptop word processor. I had one of these in college. You could type the sentence, check it, and then when you liked it, you could push the print button and it went down on the paper. They teamed up with Acer in 1990 to see if perhaps there could be a marriage between printing and computing. They decided after a while that that was too many components. Nobody would buy all those components and so they canned the deal. In, two, in 1992, they formed an alliance with Microsoft for the grammar checker, and of course in 2012, they went out of business. Now in 1989, they were worth, their capitalized value was 500 million. And they said, if anything happens with this computer thing, we'll just buy one of those companies, like Commodore, like Osborne, or like that little Apple company for 500 million. The other thing that prevented them from thinking outside the box was their chief competitor was Remington. And Remington dabbled in the computer business. And in the computer business, they tried to build mainframe computers, and in the end, they went bankrupt in 1981. So they did, certainly didn't want to go down the same path as their formidable competitor. But I love this quote from their CEO, G. Lee Thompson. What a great name for a CEO. He said in 1992, now this is three years before they declared bankruptcy, this is what he said. Many people believe that the typewriter and the word processing business is a buggy whip industry, which is far from true. There's still a strong market for our products in the United States and the world. And three years later, they're out of business. The arrogance of that. What does that mean? That means they're so totally out of sync with reality that they went down. They didn't go from here to there. And by the time they realized that here is uncomfortable, there was unattainable. So this happens over and over again. It happened to Kodak. They invented the digital camera in 1975, could not figure out how to monetize it, and so they canned it, only to be taken over. So defensive thinking will kill you. Inflexible business systems will destroy you. Fossilized mental models of what it takes to be in business. Our best way is the only way. Actually, too much money can cause you a problem. Abundant resources make us lazy. It prevents us from doing innovation. And of course, contentment and entitlement. The typewriter is not a buggy whip industry. How many still have a typewriter in the house? Somewhere down in the basement, probably. It happened to AT&T. Back in the day, AT&T had a formula. And the formula was time times distance. Remember that? You paid for the minutes, and then that was adjusted for the distance of your phone call. And of course, that died and it, Bell South took them over. We're living this right now with coal that's being taken over by gas as gas begins to come in with combined cycle. The PSC industry is particularly bloody these days. Here's a story, a care, uh, just a horrible story of HP that tried under Carly Fiorina to do Palm Pilot. She bought that. And then Ed Hurd tried tablets. And then Apothecar brought antimony for $10.3 billion. And when Meg Whitman came on board, she wrote down $9 billion worth of goodwill. 
That means that Apothecar spent nine billion more for antimony than he should have. Meg is struggling now to try and put this company back on its feet. It's a real difficult thing because they can't figure out what to build. Everything they try fails and the PC industry is dying. <coughs> so we look at Microsoft who is struggling as well. I've never seen a chart like this. You can see the chart under Bill Gates. This is the stock price. And then the stock price under Steve Ballmer for 13 years. Have you ever seen a stock go up 7% the day the CEO announces his retirement? But that's what happened with Microsoft because they couldn't go from here to there. So it happens to the best of the best. Now I'm going to give you five types of innovators. And I want you to ask yourself as I do this, who are we? Not CII, but your company. The first type is a rocket ship. Now this is a company like Spotify, Facebook, Hulu, LinkedIn. They have a great idea and the stock price goes to the moon. You get an initial IPO for Facebook and of course, you know, Zuckerberg gets infinitely wealthy through this thing. The question is, can they do act two? Maybe it's a one-stage rocket. We don't know yet. The second type is a laureate. A laureate is a company that's been around for a long time. They've got a legacy, a GE, a, a IBM, an Intel, a Toyota, a Samsung. The problem there is, they're constrained by what they think they are. They're constrained, IBM is constrained by who they think they are, G, GE or uh, Toyota. That's a laureate. Then there's the artists. The artists are the ones that have new ideas every day. They wear black jeans with holes in them. They have thousand dollar espresso machines and they, they kind of live in those parts of town, usually in the downtown but they don't know how to make a business out of their ideas. They sell their ideas. Not a bad deal. Those are all the people like uh, DDB or uh, IDEO. Those are the people that give ideas out. It's a company. It's okay. Then there's a cyborg. And a cyborg is a company we'd all like to be, but let's face it, it's awful hard to be an apple from the roots of Emerson. And I remember when I was standing in front of our former CEO talking to him about a company like Apple, he said, ah, it's just a flash in the pan. Okay, it's the largest capitalized company in the world, but uh, that's a cyborg. Again, these are companies that's hard to emulate. But I think one that we'd all like to emulate is a born again innovator, a Ford, a Procter and Gamble, and ev even an IBM that it keeps reinventing itself as they have th done just this past week. So I ask you a question, which one would Microsoft like to be? A rocket, a laureate, an artsy, a cyborg, or a born again innovator? Which one would you like to be? Nadella is facing that, he's the new CEO. What is Microsoft facing? <coughs> right now they have a horizontal business model. That means we build the software and it goes in anybody's machine. Well, until they did Surface. But uh, now we have a problem. The PC guy has been wounded. And Microsoft under Nadella just announced last week for the first time ever, 18,000 employees are gonna be laid off. I think Microsoft is struggling from getting from here to there, don't you? Yeah, that's true. And then, of course, we have Apple, who have been riding high, but I think their business model is being threatened, too. And so we have Tim Cook doing wild things, like buying Beats. I didn't fi figure that one out. And now signing up with IBM to begin to sell uh, their products through the IBM channel. But I think in the end, you're going to find out that the one that wins is not the horizontal, not the vertical, but the spherical there will be an app for that. And Google will take over everything. <laughs> you don't believe me? I think so. So what do you do when your business model doesn't work? You can do what Smith Corona did. You can do what AT&T did, and you can deny the facts. 
but you can't outrun the future, especially if you don't see it coming. Secondly, you can face the inevitable. You can learn from what we just heard from these young people. Learn from the fringe. You'll not learn it from the mainstream. You've got to always be testing the waters. And finally, refer, re rehearse alternatives, because when it's all the chips are down, it's too late. So we need to devote more and more time to testing future alternatives. Now we come to the last point. We've gotten our values right. We now know that innovation has to be the core of our, our business and all the time innovation from all levels. Now how do we adapt it to our business? You're living in a time that's different than any time in history. This little chart here that shows how much has changed is phenomenal. In our grandparents' days, they did things the way their parents did, the way their grandparents did. Nothing changed. If you were a farmer, you still had the same implements. You still had the same plow. You did it with horses. But it's all changed in the last couple of decades in a way that it's never changed before. In fact, we live in a world that seems like it's all punctuation and no equilibrium. The future is less and less like the past. And if you're not launching ahead, you're falling behind. Be you Apple or be you IBM or whoever. In just a couple of years, who remembers one of these things? Rex, you probably had one, yeah? yeah. Glenn, you still have one, don't you? Yeah. All right, so here we are all the way up to 2014. It just continues changes. Look at this Friendster, MySpace, Facebook, WhatsApp. I'm being told by my kids now that Facebook is old hat. I'm just getting on Facebook. And I'm being told that Facebook is old hat. Companies that don't stay ahead of this will fall behind. Why didn't Best Buy <clears throat> figure out the Netflix model? They understood how, that people liked movies, but they tried to sell DVDs. Netflix took them over. Pennies with their catalog, why didn't they understand Amazon? GM, the largest company, in, the largest car manufacturer in the world, why were they delayed in getting a hybrid? So here's a little chart for us. When executives say, whatever we do, don't screw it up, our young people over here would be saying, whatever we do, you know, we can't tread water. When an executive says, this is how we make money in our industry, our young people over here would say, well, it's so far as we know. How many of you have said this? Strategy is the easy part, execution is the hard part. I said that, but that's false. Strategy is often easy only because we haven't created or differentiated strategy. I'll just drop down to the bottom because we like to use this in our business. We're the biggest. Well, so is the Titanic. Now I'll give you one more story and then I'll complete. How many of you played with Legos when you were a kid? When I was in the Harvard Business School, I remember talking about branding. I'm a marketing guy. And they said uh, that the number one brand in the whole world is Coca-Cola. People recognize that brand more than any other. And number two was Lego. This little company in Denmark that makes little plastic bricks was the number two identifiable logo in the whole world. There's even a website where people go on there and they put on their experience of stepping on a Lego brick in the middle of the night. <laughs> There's story after story about what happens when you step on a Lego brick at night. So here's this company and they were eminently successful. Over the years, this company grew at a compounded growth rate of 15% per year. And this was for a quarter of a century. None of your companies in here probably could match that. I know ours doesn't. And so this was a company that everybody venerated. They just loved this company. But notice the other part of that chart there. Something happened about 2001, 2002. And I love the way these presentations are all dovetailing together. We had the interface management, which is uh, those two things I showed you. And now we have 1010. 
because here, Lego had no idea what was causing this. They had not broken down what was selling and what wasn't selling. They just had this one lump sum P&L. And all of a sudden, the P&L turned south. And they didn't realize that 94% of their Lego sets were losing money. Only 6% were making money. They just knew they were losing money. And so they should have been into a CII conference and looked at 1010. So if you're interested in this, there's this book called Brick by Brick. And it's a fascinating story of how Lego went down the tubes, because your companies can too. And uh, so we have this uh, Wharton professor here, and I'm going to play a, a clip from him who wrote this book, uh, Robertson. Here he is. Uh, a company that I've spent a lot of time with, um, the Lego Group, had an amazing failure. Um, a lot of people don't know that in 2003, the company almost went out of business. Um, and the reason they almost went out of business is because they followed the advice of academics and consultants, uh, advice about how to manage innovation. And they, uh, what they did is they, um, they tried to sail for blue ocean and disrupt their current business. And they tried to be customer centric and, and uh, customer driven. Um, they tried to open up innovation. And they did all those things. And it almost put them out of business. Um, and it's because of that failure that they are now one of the most successful companies, not just in the toy industry, but in the world. Um, they've been growing sales at 24% per year for the past four years and profits at 41% per year per the, for the past four years. And the reason why is that what they realized is those, those theories of innovation were all right. You know, we, we should be looking for new markets. We should be trying to disrupt our current business. We should be partnering with outside companies. We should be focused on the needs of our customers. And if you do all that, you can really boost innovation tremendously. Um, but they kind of boosted innovation beyond what they could control, and they almost, you know, crashed and burned. So let me take you deep into this situation. It really wasn't rocket science. First thing they realized is that Kids aren't playing with bricks anymore. They're doing video games. The patent for the bricks had run out. Now we have Chinese companies building bricks that fit together with Lego bricks. And of course, we're making these things in Denmark, which is a high cost area, high labor. And so our competitiveness was gone. And so those were three major things that were wrong. And so they hired a Frenchman. His name was Paul Plowman. And Plowman said, we're going to have to do the blue water thing. Let's get out of just making bricks. Let's get out into the blue waters where we can be differentiated. So the first thing they did is they started Lego parks all over the world. Anybody been to a Lego park? Yes. The second thing they did is they started Lego stores in the shopping centers where kids could play with the Legos. Third thing they did is they said, let's build Lego video games. Fourth thing they did is they said, we have too few br bricks. There's only 2,000 bricks. Let's make Lego sets that, ha that can build space shuttles, and let's build uh, Harry Potter, and let's build uh, Star Wars, and let's build all these things. Every one of those things required new dies, and their dies went from 2,000 to 14,000. Now, a die costs about a million dollars to set up and run. So a big investment. And then there was this old thing called Duplo. Anybody have little, ch little children here? Uh, Plowman looked at that and said, dead business, kill Duplo. How many of those worked? Do you think those are good ideas? How many say it's a good idea? Nah, some of you aren't voting. I should have had those clickers. You know what? Every single idea failed. Everyone, they aren't good at running uh, theme parks. That's a Disney thing, a Bush Gardens thing. The stores, they competed with their distribution channel through Toys R Us, through Target, through Walmart. They got their own stores trying to compete with their normal distribution channel. How do you think their normal distribution channel feels about this? Shelf space. <laughs> What about video games? Are they good at video games? How does that work out? Duplo, killing that, increasing the number of Legos. Plowman was making all the decisions. Guess what they did when they started asking their customers and they started 
doing research within their own confines. They found out that Lego was alienating those re retail chains, and also they were not paying attention to their largest customer. Who's their largest customer? The 12-year-old boy sticking bricks together? No, it's the 34-year-old guy in Germany who's building a Hogwarts castle with 15 million bricks. <laughs> they had really missed their whole target market. And so they decided, if we're going to go from here right. to there, we better start listening to our customers. And they said, Lego is a system. Every brick must plug into every other brick. That's what CII is all about. All of us need to consider ourselves as a system. Secondly, Lego is a story. They created little people because kids have imaginations. I have a little grandson that's two and a half. He likes to pretend. He loves to pretend steering the car. I can hardly wait till he gets keys. Pretend. There are now more little Lego people on the planet than there are people. <laughs> Over seven billion little Lego people. And then thirdly, not every person is a Lego customer. Certain people are Lego customers, like the 34-year-old in Germany who's building a Hogwarts castle. When they figured this out, everything turned around. And now they are growing at their historic rates once again. And here's their competition, Mattel and Hasbro. So we come close to the end. Where success is concerned, people are not measured by inches or pounds or college degrees or family background. They're measured by how much thinking they do. And that's at all levels of the organization. That's from the people who weld the pipe. That's from the people who design the pipe. So what can we do to change our thinking? In CII, we can be passionate because people that aren't members are going to be rational. We can lead because the other ones are going to be cautious. We can aim to surprise family feud, because the rest of them are just going to aim to satisfy. We can be extraordinary, because the rest are just going to be practical. We can sweat the details, because the rest are going to get it mostly right. We can think like an engineer, or we can feel like artists. And I've seen that this time. We've had cats running across this stage in the dark. Artie? We've had uh, all sorts of creative things up here. It's, this conference has just been one creative innovation after another. And so I come back to the race where Ryan Hunter Ray says, I didn't do it alone. I did it with help of well, my team. Well, we are team. thrilled to be joined by the 2014 Indianapolis 500 champion, Ryan Hunter Ray. And that must sound incredible to you after what was a fantastic race this afternoon, Ryan. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. You know, I don't think I'll ever get get used to uh, being called an Indianapolis 500 champion just because for so long I've looked up to the champions of this race and the champions of the sport. Um, and, and here we are talking about it. I'm, I'm looking over Indianapolis Motor Speedway, rethinking everything that went on today. And uh, it's all pretty surreal at the moment. For To win with this group is really the, the, the special part. To have my family there kissing the yard of bricks, it's just fantastic. And it's something I'll remember forever. My son, even today, 17 months old, had a uh, exact replica of my suit. So to debut it here at the Indy 500 and to get on the bricks to kiss him is uh, it's just uh, it's amazing. So if you hit listen carefully, he said, it was our team who did this. And it's the team that will bring us into the next century. Because back to Werner von Heisenberg, we have to remember that what we observe is not nature herself, but nature exposed to the way we question it. Think for a change. Thank you very much. So Rex, I think we have one or two questions. Am I to time for one or two questions? Is Keith Manning in the audience? I looked for you all morning long. 
He's not here. I was going to have him come up and give a story he gave me last night from Zachary. We have to mark him down on that, Wayne. He, he wasn't here. I'm Anna France, excuse me, I'm Anna France with Architect of the Capitol. Uh-oh. And I have a question. Um, I was intrigued by your comments about the balance of the teams. Yes. And it's my, perf uh, it's my perception that many companies uh, don't have the right balance. And I was wondering if you could enlighten us on companies that you think do have the right balance. Excellent question. I, I think you zeroed in right at the heart of the, of the presentation. I could have given that presentation with that one slide, and maybe I should have. I think Drucker hit it right on the head. Those companies that are doing things right, but then they have this balance of doing the right things. Over the past year since I did the presentation last year, I had an opportunity to uh, visit a couple of CII member companies. Uh, Faithful and Gould asked me to come out and uh, do a presentation in Washington, D.C. And I saw a company there that's getting it right. And then Danny Scott asked me to come down to Birmingham and work with Yates. And I saw a company there that is working both ends of this, and they're starting to move out of the commercial construction into the process construction with full participation at all levels. There was a meeting, and they allowed me to stay in their meetings, and I, as a manufacturer, was shocked at the skinny margins that EPCs work under. And I thought, whoa, 3% gross margins, that's a tough one. If you get it wrong, you go out of business. And so I was shocked at that, and yet I learned a lot from them. Uh, Janet True invited me to come to Fleur for their Employee Appreciation Week, and I spoke to 500 people in Fleur. And I was telling Glenn this morning, I saw the same thing. The core values of Fleur that are bubbling up and the top management is listening. So certainly we all have room to grow, but to your question, I've seen in the member companies of CII this openness to listen as we did this morning to these young people, to their ideas. It's a fascinating thing. I think the message is getting through. I'm pretty much preaching to the choir, I know that. I don't know if that answered the question, but those are some companies that I've been impressed with. Where's Danny? I expected an amen out of that. Okay. <laughs> Any others? Yeah, Mike, uh, Mike Peters with CB&I. Thinking about the young folks that are on the stage and, and a lot of the companies that we work in, what advice or guidance do you have for the young folks that push up against that management layer that you were talking about? How, how does that work? Um, this is going to sound brutal. You're going to be a salmon swimming upstream. And it's going to be hard. It's easier to keep your head below the cubicle and just go with the flow. And the problem with my generation is we're that close to retirement that that's what we do. But I challenge you to go against the flow. Now, it may mean that you actually might lose a job here and there. It happens. But it's a growing experience. Don't worry about it. Just keep pushing. You have to. You have to keep pushing the envelope. Eventually, the company will listen. But don't be, don't be bashful. Speak out. And what I saw here this morning, that's not going to be a problem. <laughs> if, if you can uh, tell the, the person that's interviewing you that his picture needs to be updated, um, <laughs> you don't have a problem <laughs> speaking to management, right, Glenn? That's a great question, though. I, I, want, I challenge you young people to go against the flow. Swim upstream. You'll have to. And I know when you get mortgages and you got two kids and you got college facing you and all those pressures, you don't want to do that. But what will allow the company to progress is when you do that and, and stick your head above the cubicle and speak your mind. But you don't do it alone because you, you see all these people here? You get your ideas from them. And you say, you know what? I just heard from uh, Eli Lilly. I just heard from Yates when I was at the conference. This is what they're doing. So build your argument based on what you're learning here. And it will work. 
it carries credibility when you do that. Others? I'm preaching now. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it.